Hey guys, in this video I'm going to briefly summarise everything you need to know for your first unit of AQA, A-level biology, biological molecules. Now, as you are going through this video, I strongly suggest you get the checklist, which you can download free from my website, and tick off the bits that you're confident with, and then work out which bits you're not so confident with, and then follow the links to go and fill in those gaps. If you want to really, really see if you've understood everything in this video, and you are confident at answering exam questions on this, then over on my website there are thousands of questions waiting for you. Every so often you are going to see slides like this. They will show you the start of each new topic and will give you the chance to have a little bit of a break in the middle of all your hard work. Take the chance to go and get a cup of tea, to go and do some star jumps, to do a little bit of running around and refresh yourself. Before we move on to the next topic. This is the start of biological molecules, the first topic that you need for your AQA A-level. And this topic will be needed for both AS papers and A-level paper one and paper three. There is a wide range of bonding that takes place within biological molecules. And this is an area that crosses over a lot with chemistry, biochemistry, but do not be confused, this is still a biology video. We have covalent bonding, which is the sharing of electrons between two non-metals. We have ionic bonding, which is the transfer of electrons from a metal to a non-metal. This will form positive and negative ions. And between these oppositely charged ions, there will be an attraction. And there is hydrogen bonding, which is a weak attraction between opposite dipoles. Here is water as an example. The hydrogens are a little bit positive. The oxygen is a little bit negative. Between the little bit positive hydrogen and the little bit negative oxygen, we are going to get an attraction. This is going to be a hydrogen bond. Between the oxygen and the hydrogen, there is going to be a covalent bond. This is a very strong intramolecular bond, whereas the hydrogen bond is a much weaker intermolecular bond. There are a range of monomers and polymers that you need to know about. And a great thing for you to do in biology is to look at the words and understand what the words mean. So mono means one and mer means bit. So a monomer is one bit of something. Poly means lots of and again mer means bits. So a polymer is lots of bits of things. The monomer amino acid can polymerize into lots of amino acids in a chain to give us proteins. Nucleotides are monomers which can polymerize in a long chain to give us DNA or nucleic acids. Glucose is an example of a monomer and that can polymerize into a polysaccharide or a carbohydrate. These polymers are examples of macromolecules and macromolecules are large, very large things like proteins. You need to know about hydrolysis and condensation reactions. Again, knowing the entomology of these words will really help you work out what is going on. Hydro means water and lysis means break. So a hydrolysis reaction is one that breaks a chemical bond using water. A condensation reaction is one that joins two molecules together, creating a chemical bond, and in the process of joining those two molecules together, another molecule is eliminated. This is generally water. For example, if we take a dipeptide, which is two amino acids joined together, the link between those two separate amino acids can be broken in a hydrolysis reaction 
and you can see in pink and light blue here where water has been added to either side of the amino acid. It has been added in. Hydrolysis reactions and condensation reactions happen a lot in biology. They go in opposite directions. So polypeptides can be broken down by hydrolysis to amino acids. Lipids can be broken down by hydrolysis to glycerol and fatty acids. And nucleic acids, like DNA, can be broken down by hydrolysis to nucleotides. And the reverse is also true. In a condensation reaction, amino acids will join together to form a polypeptide. And monosaccharides will react in a condensation reaction to form polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are one sugars, single sugars. Mono means one and saccharide means sugar. And these are the monomers for carbohydrates. They will have the general formula CH2O and this will just be expanded upon in long chains. You need to know some examples of this such as glucose, galactose, fructose. All of these have the same formula. They all have the same number of carbons, hydrogens and oxygens in the same amounts and the same ratios. But the structure is different. They are arranged differently in space, which means they will behave differently. There are two types of glucose that you need to know about, alpha glucose and beta glucose. They both have the same formula, C6H12O6, giving them both six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens, but they are arranged differently. The difference here is to be seen over on the right hand side. In alpha glucose and in beta glucose, the hydrogen and the OH group are in different places. One of them is up and one of them is down. There is a change in spatial arrangement. Now on a flat screen, on a flat bit of paper, this difference doesn't look too significant. It doesn't look too important, but it really is important and that's easier to see when we move into 3D. I'm going to use models to build this for you. I'm just going to build this bit here, not all of it because that would take far too much time. In black we have carbons and the bonds are represented as grey sticks. I'm going to try and keep them in the same orientation so you can see them being built. In red we have this oxygen here being added on and at the moment they look the same. Now we're going to add on the big pink bit which basically means everything else that I'm not going to make because it takes a really long time. It can look really confusing and that's not the important point of this video. Then we have the hydrogen and this is going to go in different places. You can see that it's starting to lie differently on the table now. Now we have the OH being added on. This is oxygen, this is the hydrogen. One of those will be added onto the top and one of those will be added onto the bottom. And if I hold them both in the same way for you, you can start to see that they look very different. While in 2D they look the same, they are what we call non-superimposable. You cannot put them on top of each other. It's a bit like comparing your left and right hand. They look basically the same, but you couldn't fit a left hand into a right glove because they've got a different arrangement in space. You'll be relieved to know that there is a simpler way for you to draw alpha and beta glucose instead of the way that I've drawn it for you before. This is the structure that you are expected to know. Much simpler, much easier for you to remember and understand. Alpha and beta glucose are not the only monosaccharides you need to know about. You also need to know about galactose. Structure to beta glucose. There is also fructose. Fructose is slightly different. I'm first going to draw it this way round so you can see how it compares to the glucose and the galactose. 
And then I'm going to draw it the way that it's more commonly represented with the oxygen at the top. The difference between alpha and beta glucose is the orientation of the alcohol group, the OH group, and the hydrogen on the right hand side. Whereas the difference between beta glucose and galactose is on the left hand side with the orientation of the OH group and the hydrogen group. Disaccharide is another important word. Di means two and saccharide means sugar. So a disaccharide is two monomers, two monosaccharides joined together. They are going to join via the OH group and a water molecule is going to be eliminated. This is a condensation reaction. When we have two monomers of alpha glucose joining together, we are going to get maltose. And this bond here in the middle is a glycosidic bond. Maltose is made from joining two glucose monosaccharides together. Sucrose is made from joining glucose and fructose together and galactose together. Poly means many and saccharides means sugar. So a polysaccharide is many sugars joined together. A polysaccharide is a long chain of monosaccharides joined together by glycosidic bonds in condensation reactions. The monomer of alpha glucose will polymerize into the polysaccharide that is starch. These long chains can be coiled into an alpha helix. They are insoluble, so they will not have any effect on osmosis. They can be branched, so there is going to be lots of surface area for enzymes to act on and enzymes to break it down quickly. This is one of the reasons that alpha glucose can be used in respiration. Starch is only going to be found in plant cells. Alpha glucose can also polymerize to make glycogen. This is going to have a very similar structure to starch, but it is going to be shorter and there are going to be more branches. This is found in animal cells, in liver cells and in muscle cells. This is very highly branched so it can be broken down very quickly for use of alpha glucose in respiration. And as it is insoluble it will have no effect on osmosis. Beta glucose will polymerize to form long chains of cellulose. This difference in structure will lead to a difference in function between a polymer of beta glucose and a polymer of alpha glucose. It forms long, straight, unbranched chains that run parallel to each other. These are cross linked by hydrogen bonds. This makes cellulose important as a structural material. It is found in plant cell walls. Monosaccharides and some disaccharides are reducing sugars, so we can test for these with the Benedict's test. Two centimetre cubed of your sugar solution, followed by two centimetre cubed of Benedict's solution, and heat for five minutes. And we are going to be looking for a positive result here where they are turning brick red. A negative result will be no colour change, that is going to be still blue. The brick red is going to be an insoluble precipitate of copper one oxide. This can be a qualitative test where you can say it's positive or negative or a quantitative test with the use of a colour room cell where you can see things are more positive, less positive and try and give them a value. To carry out this test on non-reducing sugars, they are first going to need to be treated to break down the glycosidic bonds. This hydrolysis reaction will turn them back into monosaccharides which can then be tested using the Bendix test. This will give a slight change to the method. Two centimetres cubed of sugar solution 
two centimeter cubed dilute hydrochloric acid to break the glycosidic bonds, heating it two centimeters of sodium hydrocarbonate to neutralize the hydrochloric acid and then follow that up with the Benedix test. To test for polysaccharides, we can do the iodine test for starch. We can add iodine dropwise into starch and if starch is present, the solution will go blue black. Lipids or fats are insoluble in water, but they are soluble in organic solvents such as alcohol. We can have triglycerides, which are fats and oils, or phospholipids. These are a great store of energy and will release twice as much energy as opposed to carbohydrates. The waxy lipid cuticles are used in plants to conserve water. They are also found in the oily glands in skin. We use fats in bodies for insulation as they are poor conductors of heat, so will keep us warm. They also are used for electrical insulation around nerve cells. Fat is used for protection around our delicate bits, such as our organs. We can test a solution for lipids by mixing the test solution with ethanol shaking it for roughly one minute, adding water and then a positive test result will give us a cloudy solution. Triglycerides are made up from glycerol, three fatty acids. Tri means three, so we're looking for something that has three connections, three fatty acids coming off it. Glycerol is joined to the fatty acids by an ester bond and a condensation reaction. There are over 70 different fatty acids. There's a wide variation in the triglycerides that are produced. It is saturated, it will only have single carbon-carbon bonds. If it is unsaturated, there will be some double carbon-carbon bonds in there. A polyunsaturated triglyceride will have lots and lots of double bonds. They are non-polar, which means they're going to be insoluble in water. They will have no effect on osmosis. Phospholipids are made up from phosphate group, glycerol, and two fatty acids. These are all joined with ester bonds. Phosphate group is hydrophilic. And the tail of the phospholipid is hydrophobic. The phosphate hydrophilic head loves water, whereas a hydrophobic tail hates water. In a phospholipid, one of the fatty acids, one of the three fatty acids we would see in a triglyceride, has been replaced with a phosphate group. The different ends of the phospholipid have very different properties, and they will behave differently. A droplet of water, the hydrophilic head will go into the droplet of water. It loves water, it wants to be around it. However, the hydrophobic tail doesn't and will stick out of the droplet of water. This property can lead to emulsions of oil and water, where oil and water can be allowed to mix because of the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tails. This will lead to the bilayer in cell surface membranes. You need to know the core structure for an amino acid. Start with a central carbon which on the right hand side where it's generally drawn goes into a carboxylic acid group off the central carbon is a hydrogen and then generally over to the left we have our amino group and then finally we have our R group we use R as a way of showing that this is the side group and it can be replaced with a wide range of other things
This is the bit that changes and changes the structure and the property of amino acids. Each amino acid has a different R group. The NH2 is the amino group. And the carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a hydroxy group is the carboxylic acid group, which is where the amino and the acid amino acid gets its name from. Amino acids can be small, they can be large, they are responsible for forming the different bonding that keeps proteins together. They can be acidic and they can be basic. Amino acids can join together to form dipeptides and polypeptides. Here we have two different amino acids and they will join together in a condensation reaction and water will be lost. When two amino acids join together in a condensation reaction, we lose two H's and an O from it and a bond forms between the carbon on one and the nitrogen on the other amino acid. The bond in the middle is a peptide bond. Di is two, so a dipeptide is two amino acids together. Poly is lots, so a polypeptide is lots of amino acids joined together. Proteins have a wide number of roles in biology. Polypeptide chains fold up to make proteins. A few examples of proteins that you need to know are enzymes, which break down large molecules or build up smaller molecules by making and breaking chemical bonds. Structural proteins, long parallel peptide chains, strong and stable. Antibodies involved in the immune response are two short polypeptides are highly variable. Channel proteins in cell membranes contain hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. You need to know how to test for proteins. That test will detect peptide bonds. You need to mix equal volumes of test solutions and sodium hydroxide, a few drops, dilute copper to sulfate. If it is a positive result, then the solution will turn purple. Copper sulfate is blue, so if it stays blue, you've got a negative result. Protein structure has lots of layers. Building blocks are amino acids. They join together to form long peptide chains. The primary structure of an enzyme. Long polypeptide chains can then fold and twist and bond with different amino acids to form the secondary structure. Either be an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Or folding will take place and we will get to the tertiary structure. And then finally, the quaternary structure of a protein, which is going to involve multiple peptide chains folded into secondary and tertiary structures and fitted all together. The primary structure of a protein is a chain of different amino acids. The R groups in amino acids them their properties, how much space they take up, whether they're large or small, how they interact with other things, whether they're acid or alkali. If an order of these amino acids in a polypeptide chain gives a wide range of different properties between chains. Part of the secondary structure is an alpha helix. 
estrogen bonds form between the polypeptide chains in a coil or fold. This is a model of an alpha helix here. You can see the carbon in black bonded to the nitrogen in blue and the oxygens in red, hydrogen in white. It is helical, there is a hole down the middle. We can see all of the different parts bonded together. The hydrogen bonds here are shown in purple. Another secondary structure is a beta pleated sheet. This has just been folded differently to the alpha helix. You can see it is flat. We have layers going across chains of polypeptides in layers. After the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets have formed, more folding will take place to give rise to the tertiary protein structure. This will have a large amount of bonding between the polypeptide chains. We'll see hydrogen bonding, disulfide bridges, ionic bonding, all leading to further folding. Hydrogen bonding is weak individually. Disulfide bridges are very strong. You can see ionic bonding between the carboxyl and the amino groups. Bonds can be broken by changes in pH. The tertiary structure can be the final 3D structure of a protein. A protein is only made from one polypeptide chain. The top level of protein structure is the quaternary structure. You see this in larger, more complex proteins. It involves more than one polypeptide chain. For example is fibrous proteins, structural, cellular proteins, such as enzymes, ones involved in metabolic function. Enzymes are biological catalysts. We lower the activation energy that is required for a reaction to take place. Here we have our reaction profile. Reaction progress along the bottom, energy up the side. Our substrates currently have higher energy than our products and an uncatalyzed reaction, the progress will go up and then down as it moves across. For a catalyzed reaction, the peak that we see the peak in the amount of energy that is required to start that reaction is lower. So it doesn't go up as high. It doesn't need as much energy to get started. An enzyme acts by lowering the activation energy needed for the reaction to start. Enzymes don't get used up, so they can catalyze a large number of reactions. Enzymes are specific about the substrate they will form a complex with. It will only work on very narrow range of specific substrates. They can work by either making a new molecule, building something up, or by breaking one down. You may be familiar with the lock and key mechanism for enzyme action. This is the old model that isn't supported anymore. The lock and key mechanism needs to have an exact match between the substrate and the active site. Only then will the enzyme substrate complex be formed. A better model then the lock and key mechanism is the induced fit model. But scientific models change over time based on the best available evidence. The limitation of the lock and key mechanism is that the enzyme has a very rigid structure. The induced fit model suggests that the shape of the active site changes slightly better accommodate the substrate. One of the required practicals you need to know is the digestion of proteins in milk. 
the digestion of casein by trypsin, which is a protease. One way that you could do this is to set up a range of test tubes and have a cross on the other side of a test tube. And then look to see with your eyes when the white colour in milk disappears and you can see that cross. You can either do this by eye or you can set a time and then use a colorimeter. This is not pink in real life. It is white and goes colorless, but that's kind of hard for me to draw and the pictures don't look amazing. One thing you can change is the temperature or the pH of this reaction and then measure the time that it takes for the solution to go colorless so that you can see the spot or the cross. You're going to need to control certain things, such as the concentration of the trypsin, how you determine a positive result, whether it's the same person looking every time or whether you're going to use a colorimeter. A colorimeter hooked up to a computer measuring the um, value of transmission of light that is allowed to go through after a certain period of time would be an improvement to using your eyes to see across. With an enzyme catalyzed reaction, we have a number of different ways we can measure the rate of reaction. We can measure the product being made, or we can measure the substrate being used up. We can plot all of these changes on graphs with time along the bottom, and either volume of gas being produced, mass of something being lost or changed, a colour change or a change in cloudiness or a change in pH. There are two different types of tests you can do. You can do a qualitative test, so what does it look like? That would be, can you see the cross through the solution? Can you see the colour change? That will give you a yes or no answer or a quantitative one. That would be an improvement that would be using a data logger to measure actual values, pH probe using a colorimeter or a gas syringe. And to find the rate at any given point, we can use the gradient at a graph, which is the changing up over the change in a cross. The units that you give your ants in are important. Volume of gas, centimeter cubed per second, mass, grams per second, colour change depending on what exactly you were measuring or pH per second. You need to be able to describe and explain the effect of temperature on an enzyme's rate of reaction. This is a little bit of a link to chemistry and rates of reaction in chemistry. Because as temperature increases, the particles, the substrate and the enzyme will move around more. There will be more collisions between these two, so a reaction is more likely to take place. The enzyme is more likely to meet the substrate and form an enzyme-substrate complex. We can see that on a graph with temperature across the bottom and rate of reaction up the side. There are two parts to this graph. In pink, we can see what is happening as the temperature increases, but that is not the whole story. Because as the temperature rises, the bonding within the enzyme starts to break down. This causes a change in the active site, altering the shape and the function of the enzyme. This is the enzyme being denatured, not killed, denatured. So at this point, rate will decrease rapidly. You can see this is not a symmetrical graph. As before the optimal temperature and after that optimal temperature, there are different things going on. And not all enzymes are going to have the same optimal temperature. 
Some enzymes will like to live at very hot conditions and some will like to live at very cold conditions. Enzymes that are at work in the body generally have an optimal temperature around body temperature. You need to be able to talk about the way that pH affects how an enzyme works. Firstly, pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. And we can write it like this. H plus inside square brackets. pH 1 is acidic with lots of hydrogen ions or a high concentration of hydrogen ions. pH 7 is neutral and we will see a balanced number of hydroxide ions, OH minus, with hydrogen ions. pH 14 is alkali, so we will have lots of hydroxide ions, OH minus, and few H plus ions. The hydrogen and hydroxide ions interfere with the bonding in an enzyme, changing the shape of the active site. Here is our graph with pH along the bottom and rate of reaction up the side. Enzymes only work around a very narrow pH, within a certain range of pHs. If it is too acidic, if the concentration of hydrogen ions is too high or too alkali, where the concentration of hydroxide ions is too high, then the enzyme won't work. It will be denatured for an optimal pHs. For example, the enzymes that work in our stomach like a very acidic condition. This is going to be different to the enzymes that are working in our intestines. If we are looking at the shape of this graph, we can see it is symmetrical as either too acidic or too alkali will denature the enzyme. For an enzyme substrate complex to form, an enzyme needs to be able to find the substrate. If the concentration of enzyme or the concentration of substrate is too low, then this is going to happen slowly. Here we have our graph with concentration along the bottom and rate of reaction up the side. And I'm going to talk about three different points on this graph, A, B and C. A is at the point where there is low enzyme concentration, so at the beginning of the graph. There are more substrates floating around than there are active sites available. Moving across the graph to point B, where we see it changing from increasing to flattening off, all of the active sites are filled up. And then at point C, the flat bit of the graph, as we increase the enzyme concentration, there are more active sites available than there are substrates to go into those active sites. At that point, substrate is the limiting factor. We can draw an identical graph switching the x-axis from enzyme concentration to substrate concentration. The shape of the graph is the same principle, but at different points, at point A, the substrate is going to be limiting and there are going to be lots of enzymes available. There are two types of enzyme inhibition you need to know about, competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, the inhibitor is a similar shape to the substrate. So it will occupy the active site. This will stop the formation of the enzyme substrate complex. Some of these inhibitors will bind for a very long time. And some inhibitors will bind to the enzyme intermittently. Leaving and allowing room for the real substrate to bind occasionally. 
Whereas a non-competitive inhibitor will be a molecule that will bind to the enzyme, not at the active site, in a location away from the active site. This binding will change the shape of the active site, preventing the formation of the enzyme substrate complex. Here we have our graph with substrate concentration along the bottom. Our line for no inhibition goes up and then flattens off as we would expect for any rate of reaction graph. A competitive inhibitor will slow down that reaction. It will get to the same level, but it will take longer getting there. Whereas a competitive inhibitor will never get to the same rate of reaction as an uninhibited enzyme. There are different nucleotides that you need to know. RNA is ribonucleic acid. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. They have a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, and an organic base, all joined together. The organic bases are where we see the differences. We have A, G, C, T, and U. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Uracil is only found in RNA. In DNA, you will find A and T bonding together, and C and G bonding together. The T that is in DNA is not in RNA. So in RNA, you will get A and U bonding together. Between A and T and A and U, there is a double bond. Between C and G in both RNA and DNA, we have a triple bond. These will make polynucleotides, with the phosphate group of one being joined via the pentose sugar to the phosphate group of another via a phosphodiester bond in condensation reactions. This chain can be incredibly long. RNA is similar to DNA, but instead of having a deoxyribose sugar, it has a ribose sugar. There are three different types of RNA that you need to know about. mRNA, which is messenger RNA. This codes the amino acid sequence. rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA. This translates the RNA and tRNA, transfer RNA. This is the bit that brings amino acids to the ribosomes. One important difference to note, the RNA has uracil as a base instead of thymine. And the uracil will take the place of thymine and bind to adenine. So you'll get an AU. It is also shorter and it is single stranded. And the ribosomes are formed from proteins and RNA. DNA replication is an important and relatively complicated process that you need to understand each individual step carefully for. It starts off with DNA helicase breaking the hydrogen bonds between the paired bases, between the two strands. This results in the unwinding of the double helix and provides two single strands of DNA. Onto these two single strands of DNA, three nucleotides will bind. This will be to the complementary bases and we will get matching strands. DNA polymerase will join the new nucleotides together, creating the phosphodiester bonds that hold everything in place. And we can see the start of replication and new helices being formed. Two identical strands of DNA are going to be formed at the end of this, and this is in semi-conservative replication. 
you can see the original DNA strand and the new DNA strand. Two scientists, Middleton and Starr, are the ones that proved semi-conservative replication in that experiment. Here we have ATP, adenine triphosphate. Now the first part, you can see the big part here, is adenosine triphosphate because it has three phosphates. We can also get a DP, adenosine diphosphate, which only has two phosphates in it. We also have a version with only one phosphate in it, AMP, adenosine monophosphate. The little bit here is the bit that will tell you how far the compound extends and how many phosphates are in it. Without any phosphates, this is just adenosine. These bonds in here are unstable bonds, meaning they're going to break easily. Breaking them only requires a low activation energy, meaning not a lot of energy is required to put in to break these bonds and they're easily broken. Upon breaking of these bonds, they release energy. When ATP is broken down in a hydrolysis reaction, it will turn into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, a phosphate, an inorganic phosphate, and energy. The enzyme that will break this down is known as ATP hydrolase. There are a large number of processes in cells that require energy. For example, metabolism, movement, active transport, and secretion. Water is an absolutely fascinating little molecule made up from two hydrogens and one oxygen. It is a bent polar molecule, so the oxygen will be a little bit negative and each hydrogen will be a little bit positive. Because of the delta negatives, the delta positives, the slightly negatives and the slightly positives, we can get hydrogen bonds formed between molecules of water. Now, individual hydrogen bonds are pretty weak, but within water, we are going to get large numbers of hydrogen bonds. So water is polar and the hydrogen bonds is incredibly important. They are involved in a wide range of condensation and hydrolysis reactions. A large amount of energy is required to break the large number of hydrogen bonds meaning that water is a liquid at room temperature, whereas you would expect it to be a gas. Other similar things are gases at room temperature. The hydrogen bonds are responsible for the cohesion and surface tension of water, and it has a very high specific heat capacity, meaning it could buffer temperature changes, which is important for preventing sudden changes in temperature within our body. It is also an important solvent. There are a number of important inorganic ions that you need to know about, and at this point we touch slightly on chemistry, but not too much. You need to know that an atom becomes an ion when it loses or gains an electron. For example, K plus is a potassium ion that has lost one electron. When you lose electrons, you'll become positive. O2 minus is oxygen that has gained two electrons. We can see that from the two and the gaining of electrons, the gaining of negative charges is the minus. Some common ones you need to remember are sodium ions, Na plus, that is involved in co-transportation across a membrane. Phosphate ions, PO4, three minus, which is essential for the phosphate group in DNA. RNA and ATP, hydrogen ions H+, and with square brackets around it, that means the concentration of hydrogen ions, and that is how we look at pH. A tongue twister here, iron ions. We have iron 2 plus in reverse reaction with iron 3 plus, and this is an important reaction that takes place inside hemoglobin. Ouch!
This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches. 